Well, Andrew, I can't think of a better time to have this conversation with the senator. Um, and I'm going to kick it to you because uh, we have a lot of news happening on the Ukraine front. Right. Um, and is my microphone? Okay, it is on. Okay, great. Thanks, Anna. Thank you, Senator Collins, for joining us. Um, I, I want to start off with what is uh, a very timely development this morning for this conversation. Uh, the Ukrainian military has begun their counteroffensive, their highly anticipated counteroffensive. Um, I'm wondering if you think this could be a turning point in the conflict. I know you traveled there last year at the very beginning of the war with Leader McConnell and a group of senators, um, so I would be really interested in your thoughts. First of all, good morning. It's delightful to join you. I do think this counteroffensive is extremely important. We've all known that it was coming, and now it has begun, and the Ukrainians are determined to drive the Russians out of their country. This has been an illegal, unwarranted, unjustified invasion started in February 24th of last year. The Iranians have shown tremendous courage, strength, and drive, and they deserve our continued support. You mentioned the trip that I made last May to Ukraine, and we took a very secret and circuitous journey to get there, as you can imagine. When we arrived in Kyiv, uh, President Zelensky met us. He had lunch with us for two hours. By the way, everything had beets in it. <laughs> and, um, and I have to say, I think he's the most inspiring leader on the world stage today. What was most moving to me was a woman I met in the square who saw my Ukrainian-American pin on. She came up and with tears in her eyes gave me a big hug and said, thank you, America. And it was so moving. They are very grateful for our support. And I think we should never forget that helping the Ukrainians deter Russian aggression is in our national self-interest. I think that's been lost in this debate. Uh, and, and it's been fascinating to see how the issue of Ukraine has creeped into the debt limit negotiations. Uh, last week, obviously, you were pivotal uh, in trying to get that commitment from Senate leaders to vote on a, uh, uh, eventually on a supplemental because the defense cap included in the debt limit bill, of course, was $886 billion. A lot of Republicans and many Democrats, uh, including you, uh, were very uh, dissatisfied with that number. Um, I'm wondering if you can take me inside the room uh, because you were there when, I believe you were all convened in Leader McConnell's office trying to get that commitment from Senate leaders. How did that come about and, and, sort of, and what is your interpretation of what the result of that was? Well, several of us on the Republican side, uh, Lindsey Graham, Don, Dan Sullivan, Mike Rounds, Roger Wicker, and others, led by um, Leader McConnell, started talking about the inadequacy of the $886 billion top line for defense. It does not even cover inflation, much less the need to deter Russian investigation, much less the threat from China. So we were determined to try to get an agreement from the majority leader, Chuck Schumer, that he would be open to bringing a defense supplemental to the floor. The administration has already conceded that there's going to need to be a defense supplemental. Democrats, it's leaders like Jack Reed, the chair of the Armed Services Committee, have said that the number is woefully inadequate to the challenges we face. So we worked for literally seven hours to try to get an agreement on language that both Senators Schumer and McConnell would put into the record that made very clear that we did not want to see um, the number be the final number and that a supplemental would have to be forthcoming. Eventually, we succeeded. 
I want to ask you, uh, we've seen a lot in the news after the debt limit passed, the deal passed. Uh, Speaker Kevin McCarthy, very uh, cold to this idea that there's going to need to be a supplemental. What do you say to your House colleagues, uh, the Republicans in particular, that are pretty skeptical of this? It's hard to judge exactly what the sentiment is in the House um, because you can be very vocal and express your views against something, but that may not necessarily represent the majority of the way people are thinking. But uh, let's just say I don't presume to speak for the House. I've never served in the House, and I'm glad I'm not in the House <laughs> right now. Um, there's much more bipartisan support in the Senate. This is going to be a challenge, there's no doubt about it. But let us not forget that Speaker McCarthy did force President Biden to finally come to the table, and as a result, we were able to avoid defaulting on our obligations for the first time in the, our history. We were at risk, real risk of that. And that would have been disastrous for our economy, for people who rely on federal programs, and for America's standing in the world. So that was the focus last week. How can we avoid default? And we did so. I want to shift to appropriations. Uh, you are vice chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee. Uh, you and the chair have committed to working in a bipartisan way on these 12 bills. We were talking backstage. Uh, I think it goes back to the late 90s, the last time uh, we had regular order uh, in, in terms of getting things passed. A lot of the senators, certainly a lot of the House members, have never been through this process before. How realistic, given the fact that we're in June, is it that this could get done by the end of the year? That certainly is our determination and our goal. Uh, Senator Murray and I have talked since the beginning of the year that we wanted to start the markups this month, and we're still on schedule to do that. Is it going to be easy? No, it is not. But I can tell you that I have yet to talk to a senator on either side of the aisle who wants to see another 4,000 plus omnibus bill pass three months into the fiscal year. That costs taxpayers more money, it's inefficient, it's unfair, and it excludes input from a lot of rank and file members. So my hope is that we will be able to achieve that goal. I would point out that the appropriations subcommittees have already held 30, more than 30 hearings. We're ahead of schedule compared to previous years. But given the amount of legislative time left, it's going to be a challenge and it's going to require cooperation. Senator Collins, um, uh, you have been on the Appropriations Committee for a very long time. You are now the Vice Chair of the Committee. Um, Speaker McCarthy yesterday said something fascinating. He said that he is now telling conservatives uh, in the House, the hardliners in the House, that the appropriators are going to be given the green light to potentially write uh, these spending bills lower than the mandated caps. Um, I'm wondering what you make of that. Well, keep in mind that, uh, first of all, if we don't get the appropriations bills passed by January 1st, there's going to be an automatic, indiscriminate, MEDEX cut across the board, which would further hurt defense spending, which is already woefully inadequate. So there's a real incentive for us to work together. Now, I think what will happen is the House will do what the House will do, and the Senate will proceed along its ways, and we'll go back to that old-fashioned concept of having a conference committee. And many of my colleagues have never experienced that when it comes to appropriations because it's been so many years since we've done regular order. But I have been in conferences, and that's how you worked out the difference. I was surprised to hear the speaker say that, because um, it, this was always envisioned as a cap 
that would be what people would go up to. There might be a supplemental, particularly in defense, but it wasn't uh, considered to be something that people would write below. But let's see what comes out. I want to zoom out a little bit when you're kind of just thinking about budgets. Um, how do you approach making some of these tough decisions when it comes to there's going to be a finite amount of money, right? And we clearly know that. Uh, what, what, how does, what's your thought process? Well, I look at the programs, their effectiveness. I have certain personal priorities that I also apply. I look at the impact on the state of Maine and on our country. Defense is my top priority. It has to be the threats facing our country uh, from China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea uh, have never been more pressing and we're not prepared enough. We have the best military in the world, but if they don't have the equipment that they need and the munitions, um, they need that to prevail. Most important, they need that to deter. We don't want to fight a war. We want to deter aggression, whether it's from the Chinese or the Russians. And so that's one issue. I'm also a longtime supporter of biomedical research. I think that there's no investment that pays greater dividends to American families than biomedical research. Another priority for mine is rural development, not surprising given when, where I'm from. And finally, I would say that we made great investments due to a bipartisan bill that I helped negotiate last year in transportation, broadband, other infrastructure. I want to make sure that's implemented. Earlier this week, Senator Collins, uh, one of our uh, uh, colleagues interviewed uh, the House Foreign Affairs Committee Chair, Michael McCall, um, who said something interesting about this, this counteroffensive, which we know began this morning. He said he believes that the success or failure of the counteroffensive will dictate the way Congress responds with a potential supplemental appropriations bill. Um, I know that you, you believe that a supplemental is going to be needed regardless, but what do you make of the view that the counteroffensive is going to be decisive in, in, in this question? There's no doubt that the American people, our allies in NATO, are watching the counteroffensive very closely. And I think one of the reasons that Americans and our NATO allies have been eager to help Ukraine is the success that Ukraine has had. Remember, the early predictions by many were that the Russians were going to take Kyiv in a matter of weeks. It wasn't going to be a long, drawn-out, effective uh, opposition by the Ukrainians. But President Zelensky has managed to unite his people in this common cause to fight for their sovereign territory. And I think people are watching the counteroffensive closely, and that if it goes well, um, which I pray that it does, that it will help to boost public support for additional assistance. And remember, we're not talking about American troops. Here we have the Ukrainians degrading the Russian army, one of our greatest adversaries, and we're not shedding any American blood. So even if you're not inspired by the cause of Ukraine, look at America's self-interest. When you think about that, right, you mentioned China, you mentioned kind of other possible future threats. Can you talk about how important it is to keep production lines, uh, you know, military equipment ready? Because that, what you're talking about is that, that actual fact, right? The help that we have given Ukraine has exposed the fact that we have a fragile industrial base. There are too many single points of failure. We do not have enough weapons and munitions that are stockpiled, and of course we've got to replenish what we have given to the Ukrainians. And other NATO countries have been encouraged and are indeed 
increasing their defense spending. I talked just yesterday with the British Prime Minister who committed to increasing Great Britain's uh, defense spending. We have new members in NATO. That's been a serious miscalculation by Putin. Now we have Finland, which shares a huge border with Russia as a member of NATO. And I hope we can get over President Erdogan of Turkey's opposition to Sweden, which abandoned 200 years of neutrality to say that it now wants to be a NATO member. That's extraordinary. So I think all of those countries, plus the American people, are watching the counteroffensive very closely. If it is successful, as I hope and believe it will be, it will help generate more support, not only here, but among our NATO allies. We are quickly running out of time, but Andrew, I'm going to leave you uh, one question here, and then we'll close it up with what my last question of the day. Um, on, on that point, Senator Collins, one of, the, one of the biggest ways that the United States has helped Ukrainians militarily has been through what's called presidential drawdown authority, the ability of the president to basically take from U.S. stockpiles and transfer weapons and equipment to the U Ukrainians. Last year, during the negotiations over the large Ukrainian sup, uh, military supplemental that, that eventually passed, Leader Schumer and Leader McConnell teamed up to double that presidential drawdown authority to make sure that the Ukrainians could get the equipment uh, faster as needed. Um, at this point, what do you think is the best way to deal with presidential drawdown authority and replenishing those U.S. stockpiles that have been, you know, pretty not depleted, but close to it uh, as a result of the, the, the weapons and the equipment that we're giving to the Ukrainians. And I would note that there's also a presidential drawdown authority for Taiwan. And so we've got to take a look at that as well. And there are two approaches. One is that we can await the supplemental that's clearly going to be coming from the administration. I don't like um, waiting a long time for the supplemental when it's obvious that we're going to need it. The earlier we can get going, the more uh, the defense manufacturers can start replacing the munitions. Uh, there have been some shocking facts that have come out. For example, the Stinger missiles, it turns out we hadn't manufactured them in years. All we had was what was in the warehouses. So we need to get going sooner rather than later. The other possibility would be to somehow plus up the regular defense appropriations bills. Those are really the only two options that I see. A defense supplemental, the earlier the better, or plussing up the defense appropriations bill. All right, we're gonna end on a one political note because we are in Washington and the 24 cycle is clearly ramping up. Before former President Donald Trump's running, you have some of your colleagues are running. Are you throwing your support behind uh, any Republican candidate yet? Well, we are very fortunate on the Republican side of the aisle to have outstanding candidates. Tim Scott, Nikki Haley, uh, Chris Christie, uh, the new governor, or he's not the new governor, the governor from uh, North Dakota. It seems very intriguing. I don't know him personally. I know the other three very well. Um, Chris Sununu's taken himself out of the uh, race, but uh, Mike Pence got in. Those are all candidates that I would happily support. I'm not making a choice among them right now, partially because I know three of them very well, and uh, that makes it rather difficult, and I think it's a little too early. I have announced that I will not support Donald Trump to be the nominee for the Republican Party, and fortunately we have great choices other than Donald Trump. All right, we'll leave it there. Senator Collins, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. All right. Walk off this way. All right, now I'd like to welcome Jill Albertelli to the stage. Jill.
Great. Thank you, Anna. Good to be here today. Yes, we appreciate it. Um, so first of all, tell us a little bit about your role at Pratt & Whitney. Well, I'm not sure that's really where we want to start. But first, I would like to just thank the Senator. Senator Collins has been amazing. Uh, great to have her here today. But she has been tremendous support for our programs at Pratt & Whitney, particularly the F-135, which powers the F-35. Uh, we have over 55,000 people across the United States that work on that program. It's in over 41 states, over 420 different suppliers. It's critical when she talks about industry really being ready to support, and we are on our toes every day with that. And she talked about her personal priorities. So in the state of Maine, we have 1,200 people. It's one of the best manufacturing facilities um, focused on that F-135 engine. And I told her a little story how they never let me go work there in my career at Pratt. So maybe that's a little bit of a hint. So really tremendous support from her with all of that. And even the message and what you're reading about today, you know, with Ukraine. So now if I go to what I do, okay, I get to be the president of Pratt & Whitney for our military engine business. So everything she talked about is what we're focused on every day. At Pratt & Whitney, we're there to support our customers, which are all the allied services. So when they talk about Ukraine and NATO and allied nations, they're flying F-15s, F-16s, and F-35s that have Pratt & Whitney power. So we like to support the women and the men that are on peacekeeping missions, and we hope that we power that freedom continuously. And we heard a lot from the senator about kind of her support for the, def the defense supplemental, the need for more funding. Can you talk about the Joint Strike Fighter Enterprise um, kind of at a high level and just its importance uh, as you see it? Sure, thank you. I do not envy um, Senator Collins as ranking member on appropriations. She has a very tough job. When we look at the F-135 engine, it's kind of the, the centerpiece of that enterprise. We've been producing that engine for over 10 years, and candidly, you know, we know how to do that very well and have ramped up to a, a great um, rate of production with it. And it's, you know, the safest and I have to be careful here. So I'm an engineer, I'm not a marketeer. It is truly technically proven, the safest, the most lethal, and most capable engine out there, period. And our data and our statistics show that. We have over 600,000 hours. So it's real experience that we talk about when we talk about that engine. And it's great when I get to be in meetings with pilots and they talk to me about the engine. I tell them my goal is for you not to have to think about it whatsoever because it's doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing, which it does. And, you know, the criticality of it was even highlighted in the recent GAO report. They talked about the fact that it's being operated really twice the specification for what we call cooling air from the engine, yet it still performs. The problem is if you keep doing it that way, it will come with an expensive bill, almost $40 billion of early maintenance. So what we're looking at is really modernization of the engine. The jet, the F-35, is on its third major modernization, and the engine has not been whatsoever. So having an engine core upgrade is what we're focused on. It's what the services selected and, and put into the president's budget and what we're supporting. And it goes with an entire network and, as I said, credible experience and performance of the safest engine in the world today. Yeah, it was, I was reading this morning on the GAO report and the president's budget, how it was included in that. What is, what's your message? I mean, you're here in Washington, you, you're not here every day, but if you, there's staffers here, there's people that are very invested in this. What's the message that you would have for Washington when it comes to the F-35? Sure. For the F-135, you know, as I said, uh, safest engine that we ha have out there, and the upgrade will continue to enhance and bring more capability to the jet. Uh, it's critically important. It's also, you know, about that threat from China and other areas, and it will be the fastest upgrade possible to help support what the rest of the jet is doing. Uh, there are other pieces to it. I think it gets a little confusing at times. So there's the engine, and then there's also power thermal management. You really need both. So certainly the engine is in, in my um, bailiwick, and then the power thermal management works together with it 
to then provide to you know the services what they need that aircraft uh, system to do all together. So I know it gets confusing. Be patient. Ask questions. That's okay. Uh, but both really need to be funded. And even doing that, it will be uh, much more economical. When I think back to you know what Senator Collins has to deal with with the stretch on the budget. You know, much more economical for the upgrades than, say, for a brand new center line engine. I want to talk about kind of the economy, jobs. Obviously, that is one of the areas where you've seen uh, a lot of lawmakers spend time thinking about, you know, how how this the defense industry kind of powers jobs. We were talking backstage with Senator Collins about the plant in Maine. Talk about the footprint as you see it in terms of what Pratt and Whitney is doing. Sure thing. So as I mentioned, you know, 55,000 people, that's that one program alone. And it's not just our company, it's multiple companies, multiple states. And, you know, as a uh, corporation, we continue to invest in locations and facilities. And the types of jobs when you're working on jet engine design and manufacturing, it is um, highly technical. They're great jobs. I joke with engineers that it's the upper echelon of engineering, but also the women and men who are our technicians on our shop floors. Tremendous credibility. I always talk about how they taught me jet engines, but really is that upper end scale um, in the job market across every single level, I'd say, throughout our company. So we continue to look to grow and partner across the United States, no question. All right, Jill, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time this morning. And thanks to all of you for joining us in person and on the live stream, as well as to Senator Collins and her team. And a big thank you to Raytheon Technologies for making this event possible. Thanks so much. Have a great day and stay safe, everybody.